Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. The thousands of small nonprofit neighborhood groups that try to improve lives and find opportunities for their communities often need help themselves. Thirty years ago, Fran Barrett founded something called the Community Resource Exchange. It's a nonprofit social change consulting firm that does just that. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. How Thank did you? you it's a brilliant idea. How did you get that idea? Uh, it grew organically, I'd say. Uh, I, you know, I got, uh, when I first came to New York, I lived for many years in, in Brownsville, which was a, a community at that time which was in great need. And what I saw there was the incredible potential of the community itself. And the idea that community organizations are really sort of the leverage point for everything good that happens in New York, or for much of what is good that happens in New York, it just occurred to me then that community organizations are sort of the major leverage points for us, all of us looking for a better society. You mean, when you say leverage points, you mean they're the closest to they're the people closest and the best to way to get something done. done. Right, exactly. And so it, it occurred to me after some years of working on the front lines in you know, organizing and doing other things that uh, I knew a whole lot of organizations who could help each other, who knew uh, things that they would mutually benefit from. So I spent about two years creating a kind of what would now be probably a web page, but in those days was mm -hmm. a directory. And these 50 organizations, uh, you know, worked with me and I interviewed them and I found out that one person is really good at human resources stuff and another person is really good at federal grantsmanship. And when it all was done, I thought, okay, this is great. Now they can all just help each other. All they need to do is look it up in the book. And they said, oh, no, you don't. This <laughs> is uh, all well and good, but uh, we're we need somebody to be the sort of interface between us. And so CRE was really born out of that idea. And that's why we're called the Community Resource Exchange. It's a great because name. we yeah. learn from organizations and we bring the information that we've learned to other organizations. So, so now, currently, you're helping how many organizations? Well, we work last year with about 300 organizations and another 500 individual people came through uh, our workshops and training sessions and leadership centers. So a fair number of uh, New York community organizations are involved with CRE now and in the more you know, current uh, way of talking about these things, we now have a fair amount of knowledge stored up from other organizations. And yeah. so also we've got a very accomplished uh, sort of consulting staff of 30 people and you know yeah. it is it's, so it's like a regular so you're but you're a management consultant who right. doesn't make a lot of money right <laughs> <laughs> well there's that yes yeah. we don't make a lot of money uh, nor do your your staff or the other consultants with you <laughs> that's right what tell, I mean what's the motivation for people working in nonprofit organizations uh, you know, the, the motivation, I can tell you what the motivation is at CRE, it's relevance. Uh, that doing work that matters is very, very hard to come by. And we try to pay a living wage, we try to be a great place to work, but we provide at CRE, I think, a great, I hope, uh, <laughs> you know, a really great sort of community, an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, you know, intellectually different community and also a culturally different community. So that when we have a client, all of us give our best thinking to that. Mm -hmm. And that isn't just, you know, consulting firms are often based in the sort of thinking of MBAs and that training, mm -hmm. and that's all well and good, but we like to mix in you know, one of our colleagues is uh, an engineer. One of our colleagues, several of our colleagues are social workers. I mean, we like to, uh, you know, look at things from a lot of different angles to see how do we come up with the best idea. So it's a ba it's basically people who have a sense of community and of a common good. And, yeah, yeah. You know, that thing that some of us grew up with. Yes. That many people aren't, I think, these days. I don't know. Well, yeah. You see, but you see it in a lot of communities. We see it every day. Uh, you know, um, yeah, we see the best of New York every day, mm -hmm. uh, the, and that's a very lucky thing. And and the, we kind of, you know, we get off on that. We get to yeah. find somebody great in Staten Island who's doing something no one else ever thought of doing. Or we, it's really a privilege when when yeah. organizational leaders turn to us and say, "I really want to do something in my community, whether that is to start an after-school program or help with, you know." 
battering or whatever it is we're just lucky that people turn to us and say can you help us with that do you find that there are more and more cultural groups doing that i mean with the waves of immigration and different yeah there are so many different kinds of so many different people living in this right i think the 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 fact that there are so many new immigrant groups is is really in response to the reality that there are so many new immigrants and it's mm-hmm. very uh you know sort of consistent for them to band together to try to mm-hmm. form something and to try to make something happen and they do in fact provide a sort of portal for their own for their own kind of neighbors and other immigrants to come to understand you know something like entitlements or something like you know the school system or something like you know that even the transportation system so they are uh you know an, an incredible kind of bridge for immigrants into into the society at large in new so, york so we know i mean the people who go into this kind of work both the local groups that you're talking about and the consultants um do they have a different kind of soul <laughs> <laughs> i don't i can't ever figure I i'm so I'm interested in knowing what, what forms the inner part of somebody I think it's it's, it's it may be uh, I don't know it's, it's an interesting genetic. it's an interesting <laughs> question I doubt that it's genetic um because well, I have six brothers and they're all construction workers so <laughs> something would have gone terribly awry with me um I think it has to do with what you're exposed to yeah. I think the idea like of seeing a community work to see what's possible uh even if you don't see it in your own life but you see it in another yeah. place some aspiration some hope i mean we're consultants and we know that the most important thing we bring when we've got lots and lots of business skills lots and lots of training but what we bring is hope we bring yeah. you know what it's not all over we can figure this out this is fulfilling somebody's dream right. but then the people who have the dream i'm always excited when i speak to yeah. somebody who comes up with that kind of a dream rather than a marketing plan <laughs> in a corporation so it's yeah. it's a whole different approach yeah. i guess yeah. to life well, why are nonprofits so important in the city for a lot of reasons and with the reasons we've just been talking about in that they are sort of the 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 filament that connects a lot of the city um they're also the second largest employment sector in the city uh there are more people working in the nonprofit sector than work in finance insurance and real estate combined and you know how much attention we have paid to, to those very fi- important sectors we even sectors. given them a name fire and fire right. right but the nonprofit sector is a huge employment sector and a sector that employs very often from local communities local like local mm-hmm. nonprofits very often are the first hire for somebody in the community and so um this is a, you know a very valuable contribution forget about what they do this is just a very valuable contribution that that the nonprofit sector makes to New York and this has been first and foremost documented by a professor here at CUNY John Seely who did some of the original work looking at the nonprofit sector as as a uh, as an economic sector you know as an employment sector it also provides services that the city isn't prepared or doesn't do. Right. Uh it's also got a lot of things that are outsourced to right. nonprofits, right? right. I, I think, you know, the, you know. I, I just had to use that term, I'm sorry. <laughs> the one that comes to my mind right. is privatization. Yeah. Oh. Um but the idea that some things that city government is not uh you know prepared to do or staffed to do and yet city government or state government sees it has to happen that's very uh you know then it's very common for the nonprofits to for the city to subcontract out to the nonprofits a good bit of service i mean an overwhelming amount of the money that flows into the nonprofits flows from city and state budgets so obviously budget cuts are a very scary uh thing for the nonprofit sector as they are for everybody but particularly us and do you know a, what's happening in the state Uh, right city. now right now <laughs> no even the I mean, federal government now no i mean the feds had you know there was some freeze action today we don't know what that would happen but everything's uh intertwined you know like if there is a freeze on say reimbursements for medicaid or i guess medicaid would be the one then that affects all the agencies that are doing mental health and other types of services mm-hmm. that are reimbursed on an individual basis so It's a very tough business uh and I think along those lines we have some really brilliant uh 
managers of nonprofits. I mean, I think that many of the people who work in the for-profit sector would agree if they knew that they simply couldn't do what we do because we're presented with an impossible task. Okay, there are, you know, there's, you know, 40 families here who are being displaced or 50 young people whose school is being closed and they were tied very much to a particular after school program and how is that and there's no there's very little infrastructure and so mm -hmm. and there's very little money in the best of times so they have to have great initiative yeah, right they have to be imagination very creative. creative right Right. Resiliency, yeah. everything, flexibility. Yeah. It, it, a sense of humor helps. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm always am amazed. I mean, from working in the government with people who worked in the government, they always wanted to be tested in the private sector. I assume there um, are some people in the nonprofit who feel the same way that you don't really make it until you're in the private sector. Yeah, I, I maybe don't, not. Yeah, I don't know that the people in the nonprofit sector feel that, so way, that way. But I, I remember one time sitting next to somebody uh, at. Uh, a dinner, a corporate executive who said to me that he thought I could get a real job. <laughs> so, you know, I think it is That's sort so of incredible. the... incredible. What did you say? I just laughed. Uh -huh. So, but, you know, the reality is that um, there, we don't have enough coming together of the two sectors. We don't have a great understanding of each other. Um, but increasingly, uh, the, the next generation of leaders, I think, are are looking to do something that combines the kind of the ability to make right. a living and the ability to to do social enterprise. So are we we were, are we touching souls more souls? Do you think souls are touched? <laughs> I, I'm I'm hoping that it's not you know in in the concept of a simple answer. You know, like if it, if a, if somebody from the corporate sector just comes and whips us into shape, we'll be fine. I think there has to be some lessons learned from the experience that they've had in the last couple of years. Uh, but I do see like sort of in the, if you look at the graduate school enrollments mm -hmm. in nonprofit management and at the Columbia School of Social <coughs> Enterprise under, you know, Ray mm -hmm. Horton's work, you see like enormous growth and enormous interest from the part of uh, on the part the of young people. And the people, yeah, and the graduates, and so, you know, I don't know about you, but I could be doing nothing but informational interviews all day long because so many young people are interested in mm. the sector. The question, one of the things that I observe, and I don't really have a big answer about this, is that there's really no way into the sector. Like you kind of have to know someone or to get into a nonprofit. You, you, you really? know, it's there's no yeah. one portal. There's no one way to say, okay, this, there's no one place that you can go and see the whole sector and say, oh, gee, you know, this oh. is for me. I want to be over right. there. But, you know? but a lot of the people in non the nonprofits range from very small right. to large, right? right? So uh, a public hospital is a nonprofit. Yes, exactly. And what else? The school system. Uh, schools, well, it's a public, that's a public agency. Yeah. You know, right. I think that, you know, we do have like even within the range at CRE, we have nonprofits with zero money, and we have nonprofits with operating budgets of fifty million. Yeah. The problem with the fifty million level organizations is it's, it's a collection of government contracts yeah. more than it is any kind of any kind of corpus of money that they have on their own. So they they have a million uh, sort of requirements that they have to meet in order to deliver. So if on they all their have contracts. if they have government contracts, then they're direct services. Is that mostly, mostly direct service? That's mostly what government does, yeah. and direct service and is that's of course what you the call, thing. Like, is that what you call privatization? Except that this is to a nonprofit instead of a profit yes. making. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the immigration facilities are now privatized. Yes. They're profit making. Well, some of them are, yeah, and that there's still hundreds of immigration immigrant groups out there that are try trying to the do. The other thing is that immigration these, services. The immigrant nonprofits, small. They become advocates also, which yes. is very important yes. in our system of government. Yes. And there's a fair amount of um, awareness about the need to make a case in a more rigorous way than mm -hmm. we have in the mm -hmm. past. And so even the tiniest organization is looking for how does it show results? How does it, uh, you know, demonstrate that it, that it is fulfilling a very important need? So is that a technique from a corporation to a... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think we've been really adept at, at uh, bringing things in from the corporate sector that work for us mm -hmm. and using them. And uh, th this, I would argue that in New York, we probably have one of the most sophisticated nonprofit service centers in the country. We, there has been, there were people who 25 years ago were very 
thoughtful of people like Hildy Simmons, at, at, who was then at Morgan Bank, Morgan Bank okay. yeah, who who thought about the fact that um, we have to build the capacity of the sector. We have to make this sector strong enough to be able to deliver the services that we're going to expect it to deliver. Mm -hmm. So we have premier organizations, not just Jeff Canada, although he is brilliant at at, at uh, I was going to say Reedland, <laughs> but at Harlem Children's Zone. Um, and that program has been picked up enormously at the federal right. level, and they're looking to recreate promised neighborhoods all over the country. But we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Jeff Canada's out there who have great programs, who do remarkable things, who make miracles happen. And the frustration right now is having spent all of this time building this capacity, and right now there's more demand than we've ever seen for services because there are so many people in need and the money isn't there for the nonprofit sector to be able to deliver. Now it's frustrating if you see that there's a demand and you can't meet it, but it's more frustrating for me to say the demand is there and I know exactly who could meet it, but they don't have enough money to be able to, to meet the demand. So, and I, so is there, do you go to the government to try to say this? Uh, I, I will say the mayor and uh, and particularly Dep Deputy Mayor Gibbs have expressed a lot of interest in the nonprofit sector. They have come to realize, I mean, one of the big issues with the sector is efficiency, and they have come to um, realize that the transaction cost between a tiny little organization and the city of New York is just way too high. Yeah. So they are looking for ways. What does that mean? It means that... Um, whether you have, like say, you know, many nonprofit organizations would get, say, a member item from the city council, right? Right, I wanted to talk about that. So, yes. so that money, maybe that's $5,000 yeah. and it's going to a local right. daycare center. That daycare center, when you were in the city council, that daycare center director comes to you and says, Ronnie, we really need this money to do this. Right. And you would say, this makes sense and it's good for my community, right. I'm going to approve it. But they don't have then a contract with their city council person. They have a contract with a city agency for which they are ill-prepared. They then have yeah, to, to deal with the bureaucracy. Yeah. And so that's the kind of procurement mismatches that I and think... And also the delay in reimbursing, is which serious. is terrible. Right, yeah. serious. So um, is, what is the lobbying effort on nonprofits? Who does that? Well, Human Service Council, I think, does yeah. a fair amount of lobbying right. uh, for nonprofits. And after that, it's, you know, some nonprofits are politically savvy and hire lobbyists. I think I remember when uh, Speaker Quinn was first, uh, was first speaker, she said, you're not going to need a lobbyist to talk to your government. And I think that's you know, that's and still true. true. Yeah. So, uh, but a lot of people do, like nonprofit leaders don't necessarily mm -hmm. understand government or right. politics. So, right. you know, you have to be able to figure out the system you're dealing in. And so some people have, um, you know, you'll f they'll form around an issue, like I think aid service organizations have from time to time formed around an issue or, or um, you know, yeah, battered domestic women, violence, domestic violence, things, yeah. or juvenile justice You have people. to, I mean, I, I assume yeah. they all, go into sub, you know, they, yes. they're larger, they join another group yes. of, yeah. of but the, cohorts. The, the, the problem with that is that, that the nonprofit leader who is uh, also running a direct service organization very for the busy. most part yeah. can't go to a million meetings. Right. So uh, it, it's, and it's then very time-demanding. Then when you have a program that you know that works, yeah. and you know there are regions other than your city or someplace or neighborhoods that could do the same thing, who does that process of selling? Anybody? Well, it's the more entrepreneurial, like some of the settlements, I think, like say settlement houses have traditionally been geographically based, uh, but now they're looking around, like say the settlement house in the Lower East Side, I think University Settlement is the first settlement and a good one to look at, and they are now doing, they've just opened a, a youth center in uh, Brooklyn, I oh, think, yeah. in Brownsville. So I think that it's more opportunistic than it is right. systemic. And do, all, do you think then these groups, like domestic violence, there are national conferences or regional conferences, do, is it like, do they, does the pollen, I mean, it's like pollen, you know. To some degree, I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the issues is that the sectors divide it by by issue like domestic violence or at-risk youth and 
And yet, when you're actually on the ground in a poor community, um, families don't show up and say, I have an at-risk youth here right. or, you know. So mostly on the ground, people are right. doing more multi-service, but they might be funded to do just one thing. So that means that only yeah. a yeah. half of the time that they're working is actually covered by their revenue. That's so, an interesting um, question. And the more they have to prove and submit the records, the more difficult it becomes. The more it becomes. Yeah. And also the, the, the demand of time to do the documentation is is terrible. significant. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, so, you know, they the papers always pick up on somebody who's done something wrong in a yeah. nonprofit. Yes. And then it and then you know the senators get up and they talk about pork. <laughs> yeah. McCain and his pork. But we know that a lot of that pork is very useful. That's right. right? And the discretionary items that they attack in the in the state legislature and in the city. A lot of nonprofits, as you said before, they couldn't exist without those little no. dollars that come in. No. So how do we... Well, I think we have to change... Um, I was just talking to Speaker Quinn about this. I, I think that there's a moment here to change the perception of the nonprofit sector. There, there have been historically you know, a very tiny percentage of nonprofits that have not done the right thing for personal gain reasons. Mm -hmm. I think people have, you know, maybe not done the right thing because they didn't know, then somebody like us tells them and then they stop doing mm -hmm. it. So I think the idea of personal gain came in the case, you know, of the member items at the city council, but it came more from the council and then it came from the yeah. nonprofits. Right. So, um, but I think we we can look at that, but I, I, I suspect that we would do better as a city to look at the incredible contribution that the nonprofit sector makes to the city at large. It has to be more valued, not as you were saying, thought of as less than a corporation, and it has to be also valued for the you know the range of activities that the nonprofit sector delivers to the city every single day with a fair amount of grace, with a fair amount of, uh, you know, ex um, excellence, I guess I'd say. And so, you know, it does feel like we're sort of looking at the, we're looking at a tiny little have piece to, instead of taking a right. broader look. And we have to balance it also because we, the reason they, the fire industries are so important is the revenue the city gets that's from right. them. And that's because they have higher salaries. That's right. right. The, the nonprofits are basically saving the city money. In the long run, yes, saving the, and we pay taxes. I mean, we, we don't pay, pay sales tax, yeah. but we pay real estate tax. We pay the the new payroll tax, and the and, right. and the employees pay their taxes. Right, exactly. Right. So, but the but the salaries are low. Yeah, the salaries are lower. So the city doesn't get the revenue. So somehow you have to show. Well, the that's contribution. true. But I would argue that the salaries are lower. But well, then you have to perception. put a price on what the services are. Well, yeah, but I think that more. I just think this, I can't prove it, that more nonprofit staff people live in the city yeah. than in the, uh, the, than, suburbs, than the corporate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, that money more of, you're going to find nonprofit workers in the five boroughs. I hope they can continue to live here because the prices are getting, <laughs> it's getting so expensive. Well, yeah, it's that's a horrible. A, probably right. <laughs> another show. So the other interesting thing that I want to talk about, your dinner partner, well, you could get a real job. <laughs> It seems to me, from my own personal observations, the people who come from the private sector and think they can run in the public sector, the number of disasters is higher <laughs> than the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Well, there aren't too many nonprofit leaders who've gone on to run major corporations. <laughs> right. But, but wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> it could be it so would great. Be, yeah. We you should think have one that of Ben those... and Jerry, for instance, must have been yes. involved in a in a non, in a non yeah. maybe they were I don't maybe know. we can have one of those re role reversal right. days and trade yeah, off nonprofit leaders yeah. one. but that's true isn't it yeah it's it's true that um, nonprofit leaders are tested more forced every single day to sort of reach inside themselves and find the the will to find a new answer or to move mm -hmm. ahead you know so I think that. Um, it's more, it goes more to the heart of you. I mean, never having run a corporation, I don't and know. And it's more respect for, I mean, the hierarchy, although it's there, 
but the respect for workers is higher. Yeah, there's a clean. A, non, a nonprofit isn't going to hire somebody at substandard wages. Not if they can avoid it. I yeah. mean, they, yeah. they, some I mean, of the contracts, right. you know, require right. that, but it's some, not something right. they would revel in or be glad no. of to be right. able to keep costs down. You know, and nonprofits have a kind of. Uh, or have traditionally had a kind of social compact with mm -hmm. their staff, which is the salaries aren't very good, the work environment is better, we will train you, and we will pay for benefits. Now, on that last point, we're beginning to fray because and health, and, health, health and insurance costs are so, so high. high. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's kind of hard for everybody right now. Um, you have a website that people can go I to? I do. And small organizations, you, you charge a scale of fees from zero to whatever not really. I mean, we, oh. tr we try. Well, first of all, what's important for folks to know is that they can get to us now through 311. The mayor, mayor's office set that up. So if you're a nonprofit leader and you're sort of sitting That's there and don't know what to do, you can call 311 and eventually you'll get linked to us. Uh, also, you could approach us on our webpage. The way in which we try to get paid is through third-party payment arrangements. So we might have a contract with an agency or a contract with a private foundation. The New York Foundation has been in partnership with us for so years. In other as words, they the could New get York a foundation Community grant Trust. sometime to pay for you. Or That's, we might have a grant that allows us to, to work them. with them. So they, they should get in touch with us. We so do the best we can to make something happen. happen. Yeah. That's great. It's not our inclination to turn people well, away. So thank you very much. This thank the you, end of the Ryan. hour. Oh. And, uh, I hope that people will go to the website crenyc.org. -E -E yeah. Thank you, Fran Barrett. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.